now for a couple of years, a year and a half, something like that, that I've been uh, discussing with him about resilience. He's in the uh, social sciences department at a joint point that he just disclosed. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to have him here to speak with us because he brings really deep knowledge about disasters and recovery of disasters uh, of various sorts. And also, I think, some really interesting insights into the role of social networks uh, in terms of disaster response, disaster recovery. Um, and, um, you know, social networks, social capital. And I think, it's just, I think it's just a really interesting angle that from my acquaintance with resilience from the network science point of view, there, I hadn't seen it before. And so it was really interesting for me, and I hope that the rest of the crowd also. Thank you, Michael Leslie. Thank you all for coming. I'll pause this early. <laughs> so happy Friday afternoon. And just in case there are questions I can't answer today or have time for, uh, both my Twitter handle and my email address are there. Feel free to reach out on either. I'll probably respond in about four hours. That's my average time for response, which is probably scary, but uh, I'm still married though, so it's okay. Uh, I want to begin with why I care about this kind of stuff, and then go into some concrete details from a book we have coming out in about four weeks uh, called Black Wave. And the, this process really began back in 2005. You probably recognize this for those of you like Mardi Gras, because that summer we moved from Boston after I finished my graduate studies down to New Orleans, got a new home, a car, filled it with stuff. And then about six weeks later, wow. Hurricane Katrina came. Wow. I destroyed our house, our car, paper records, our hard drive, everything we owned basically but one small bag of stuff. And my university, which was Tulane, shut down for that semester. So I had no job, no place to live, and no transportation. My impression at that time, which was mistaken, was that either the market or the state would step forward. By the market, I mean things like insurance, right? We all expect that if you have a health problem or a car or a or whatever, you'll get money from your insurance company. And it, in fact, it didn't work. We didn't have enough time to activate homeowners insurance, so we had no insurance coverage at all. And we hoped that FEMA would step forward, like the big white knight kind of thing. Uh, unfortunately, FEMA rejected our applications for the first seven months. So neither the market nor st state stepped forward. What really helped us at the moment, back in the fall of 20, 2005, were friends, friends of friends, groups outside the area, colleagues in Boston, uh, colleagues around the country. So it really began me thinking, you know, what does it mean to bounce back? What drives the process? So a colleague and I, Rick Wheel, in all of our free time, uh, began soon afterwards going to every vertical door in the city of New Orleans. And we got around 1,000 to do them. And we asked a lot of questions, but the simplest one was this. On a scale of one to five, how has recovery gone for you? Okay? So one, not at all recovered, was the red, like a traffic light, up to five, fully recovered. So you guys are all smart. Uh, your pictures are on the front of Nature Magazine. You tell me, what's the correlation? I'll forget to tell you. All right. So this map has several things. Of course, it's a map, like Pontchartrain, uh, this is the Mississippi River at the bottom. My house was on Canal Boulevard right there. This is Tulane. Uh, this is the Lower Life Board here. And this stuff in the background is water depth. Okay? Mm -hmm. This very, very uh, pale area here is less than one foot of water. The yellowish areas are one foot to four feet of water. The light blue areas are five to eight, and the dark blue, which is most of it, is eight plus feet of water. So you guys tell me, what's the correlation between water depth and recovery levels? Seems to be random, right? That's Everyone's on board, yeah? yeah? Yeah, here's what I thought we'd find. I figured what we'd find would be that every area that was Less, less flooded right uh, here would be solid green, and all the dark blue would be solid red. The correlation is about 0.16, meaning pretty random, actually. Two more things to notice, by the way. One thing is a question about resilient systems. People often ask me afterwards, how is New Orleans doing? And it's a stupid question, right? Because look at New Orleans. This is the city of New Orleans. There are entire areas we couldn't find people to talk to, right, in the normal life where it's these big areas we could find zero people in the area, right? So that area is doing really badly. Look at this area here, right? 11 feet of water in Bal Balaj to West. Every single family we talk to, doing solid green, right? So talking about a system as large as a city, as resilient or recovered, doesn't make any sense. Resilience and recovery are micro social events. The other thing we noticed, by the way, was this clustering, right? We found a lot of the negative scores of people not doing well were individuals who are by themselves. So after a lot of research, I spent about a year and a half of the time in Japan, studying earlier disasters, spent time in India, in the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, and of course time on the Gulf Coast, I made the following argument. That what drives resilience and recovery are the internal characteristics of the community. 
Not the, event, not the size of the shock, how much water you had. We'll see in a few minutes how big the tsunami was in Japan. But rather the strength of the connections. And it matters what kind of connections that you have. You cannot just talk about social ties as some uniform mass. There are three types of things we've talked about. The first we call bonding social capital. This is also called homophily in sociology. And it means most of our friends and close acquaintances look and sound like us. So for example, if you're a fast-talking, English-speaking, middle-aged academic in Boston, probably most of your friends look and talk like you. If you're a Patanavar fishing cast member in Tamil Nadu, probably your friends are like that. The good thing about humanity is we bridge beyond those internal networks to other ethnicities, races, religions, and so forth, often through workplaces or labs. It could be through a baseball team or the Toronto Raptors for people getting jobs in Toronto, right? It could be all kinds of areas that build ties beyond who we are by our indigenous connections, right? Bridging ties. Now, those are both horizontal ties, bonding and bridging. We also have linking ties. These are vertical ties to decision makers, people in authority. It could be the chancellor. It could be the head of the Red Cross or the mayor's office, right? I'm going to argue today that these three different types of connections bring different resources during a shock. The very first decision made by any survivor of a major shock is whether or not to go back and recover and rebuild that home, that business, that apartment, or to leave the area and go someplace else. If you remember Albert Hirschman from the 1970s, right, he argued in a business there is exit and voice. What does exit mean after a crisis? It means the costs of rebuilding are so high. There are financial costs. The gap between insurance, in my case none, and the actual cost of rebuilding, pretty, pretty big gap there. There are psychological costs. Every day you're someplace when you lost a family member, a pet, you got hurt. There's piles of rubble nearby. There's no baristas that you like. Whatever it is, right? Those daily things can add up. We'll talk about that in a second. The third type of cost, opportunity costs. Every day that you're in a business area where there's no clients coming nearby, right? You could be someplace else running your business and making a profit. So the costs are pretty high. Exit seems like a pretty good option for many people. So why would you stay and rebuild that, whether it's New Orleans or Tamil Nadu or anywhere else? So what we found is the following. Individuals who feel a sense of place, a sense of community, a sense of belonging. By the way, we can measure those, of course, we will in a second. Right? That feeling of connection to a network often overcomes whatever costs might be there. A very simple example in Fukushima, where we go with my students over the summer, near the nuclear power reactor. The elderly that had to move from there told me regularly they don't care about the danger, they simply want to go home. Their sense of belonging is so strong, it overcomes whatever radiological hazards they might face. So for them, that voice is very powerful. We found around the world, across societies and time, stronger social ties mean people use voice and not exit. The second theory here is collective action. Many of the challenges we face post-crisis can't be solved by one institution or one family by themselves. The most tragic example comes from Haiti in 2010 after the earthquake there. If you follow what happened, all of the government literally was killed. I think a third of them were killed, the rest fled. There's no police officers left, there's no national guard left. How do you keep your family and your stuff safe if you live in Port-au-Prince after the earthquake? If you're lucky and you have a community that you trust, as they did, each family puts in one hour into a daily patrol. So when you're sleeping at 2 o'clock in the morning, someone else is watching your stuff. If you don't trust them, if you don't know them, if you believe that your stuff's still at risk, you're not going to sleep very well. It's not going to work well as a community. Where social ties are stronger, collective action is much easier. So post-crisis, there are many things like this. Cleaning up the neighborhood, for example, getting a voice heard to authorities, keeping crime low. In all those cases, much easier to get things done when we have strong social ties. One more broad idea, I'll get the data next. Informal insurance or mutual aid. In most cases post-crisis, there are no longer providers of childcare, medical care, food, water, gasoline are shut down for weeks if not days. My, my community, for example, in New Orleans, had no gasoline for five months. So if your car needs gas, you have to drive seven miles to the nearest place over in Metairie. Childcare wasn't available for four months. So what do you do if you have a job and kids at home? You better have a relative or friend nearby who can watch them, right, as you're going to work, or some kind of agreement you can make. It's only possible to draw on informal insurance if you've invested time and trust before the shock. If I knock on your door afterwards and say, hi, I'm Daniel, can you watch my kid for a few hours? I'm not going to go very well for either of us. Okay, this is a pretty abstract. I want to give some data now. I have some recent events in Japan. Roughly now eight and a half years ago, on the 11th of March, 2011, at 2.48 p.m., there was a massive 9.0 earthquake in Japan. Now, that quake was so powerful, in fact, 
GPS units and roads still not aligned because the continent shifted about four meters. That earthquake itself didn't do much damage. Building codes are strong enough in Japan, most buildings stood. But the 18,400 people who were killed were killed by the tsunami, as we see here, or forced out by the evacuation from the radioactive meltdowns at Fukushima. I'll talk about that in a second. This image is kind of misleading, actually. This image looks like a bathtub lip, right? Kind of looks like it's flat. This is a seawall. It's about 30 feet tall, right? That water is coming over the seawall, and these vehicles, unfortunately, were, were driving along the road when that sea came over the side. They couldn't see the hazard that was coming because of the physical infrastructure that was there. So these are some of the victims of the 18,400 people that were killed. Now, the question for us as social scientists was, what happened with mortality along the coast? Were there some areas where mortality was higher or lower? Our first cut was, maybe what drove mortality during the shock was the power of the event. Kind of skeptical, right, because we saw New Orleans already didn't seem to have strong connections, but maybe it does. So we simply mapped out how tall was the tsunami when it came ashore? And what was the mortality level in that village? You guys are all smart, right? You got this stuff down. If there were a good relationship between the two, right, there'd be a 45 degree angle line coming out, right? We can kind of see that in some areas. There's just some very strange examples. This is the village of Tanahata. The village was 19 meter tsunami, and we're on the what, 11th floor here, right? Yeah, so you'd look down and you'd see five floors below this thing of water coming in. Right, into your village. There was no 11th story building there, unfortunately. Right? So, but the rate of death is only around 2.5%. Wataricho, Iwanuma, Tagajo, these communities had much shorter tsunami, not even 10, 10 feet, right? 3.5 meters, same level of death. But look at Onagawa, Otsuchi, these communities had relatively short tsunami, but incredibly high death rates, 1 in 10. Right? So, the benefit of being a social scientist like me is at that time in Fulbright to ask annoying questions. So I did for a long time. So I went around Japan asking people really annoying questions, like, your village lost a tenth of the people there, what caused that? So I grouped the answers I got into five categories. <coughs> the most common answer we got, unfortunately the wrong one I believe, was it was the impact and power of the wave itself. I just showed you a diagram that probably doesn't seem to be right. Now, the second answer I got pretty regularly was a nice and cynical one about politics. How would politics at the national level or the local level somehow change mortality rates? Imagine that your village, your town, your city, for a long time supports the power that's out of power, the party that's not getting the stuff. And you annoy, therefore, the, power, the party in power. And over time, they begin to pull stuff. They pull funding for early warning systems. They pull funding for your firefighters and your early warning rescuers, right? Kind of cynical story. I like it. So one possibility is, beyond the power of the event, what if the politics of the community impact the mortality? I've got colleagues in engineering, and they're very nice people, but they only had one question for me. How much concrete was there between them and the hazard? Right? How big was the seawall? How tall was the berm? What kind of physical infrastructure was in place to keep people safe? Colleagues in demography and sociology argued that during a shock like this, what matters is age. The very, very old and the very, very young are most vulnerable during the shock. Therefore, the oldest communities would be the ones with the highest mortality rates. One more story we can tell, my favorite one. What if somehow those bonding and bridging ties made a difference in that shock? So how would that look? What's the narrative? I'll give you a story. The earthquake is around 2.48 PM, right, as school is getting out. But the tsunami arrived around 3.35, about 40 minutes later. Now, the average home in Japan on the coast is 1.8 kilometers, about a mile from high ground. So do the math. In 40 minutes, can you get one mile? Probably most of us in the room look like we probably could. But if, what if you're in a wheelchair? What if you're elderly or infirm? What if you don't even know there's a shock cut? What would you do? Right? So the story that we heard from people who did survive was the following. Their neighbors would come and knock on their doors and say, this is Tanaka. There's been an earthquake. We've got to get you to safety. Come with me in my car. I'll drive you uphill. Or in some cases, I'll put you on my back and I'll carry you uphill. Now those stories require several things. First of all, you've got to know you have a neighbor. Of course, in this room, I'm sure the answer is large, but if I asked you how many of you know the first and last names of your 10 closest neighbors, of course, you all would raise your hands, right? Because you're really dedicated, civically engaged social people with the last of those emphasis networks, so you know that it really matters, right? So of course, you all know those people. But most people in Boston couldn't answer that question, right? Same thing in most of these villages. They don't necessarily know their neighbors' names, or even if they're home, or if they need help. Do you know if they were on dialysis, or if they have a 
need for some kind of medicine that comes in regularly. You gotta know you've got a neighbor who needs help, and you've got to put yourself at risk to go help them. Because every minute that you're there in the vulnerable zone, right, you could be dying pretty soon. That requires mutual aid, collective action, and informal insurance. So let me ask you, which of these categories do you think drove mortality during the 311 tsunami in China? Networks. I like the answer a lot. <laughs> so we have all kinds of models I can show you, but here's the simulation that we can put together from the actual data. Imagine the average community along the coast, so average demographics, average level of tsunami, every, all that kind of stuff. But we allow the crime rate, which is one measure of social cohesion, to vary. And then we have a simulation to see what level of mortality we expect to find in that average village. Here's the cool thing. If you live in Lake Wobaga, right, where all things are above average and everyone gets along, right, meaning almost no crime, then we expect roughly one in a thousand people to die in the snow. You can't avoid uh, mortality, someone's going to die, but very few. But holding everything else constant, including, for example, physical infrastructure, social demographics, as cohesion breaks down, you go up to 1 in 50 deaths, which is much closer to the actual data that we saw. So in this very first stage of the crisis, individuals survive, not because they're old or young, not because they've got a seawall because of political connections, they survive because they're in a cohesive community where the network activates and saves their life. That's the first stage. Here's the second stage. Who builds back then in the years afterwards? This is a village called Ishinomaki. No Photoshop was involved, I promise. You can see the exact same angle on the left and the right. This was taken about two weeks after the shock. That was taken two years afterwards. You guys tell me, has Ishinomaki recovered from the tsunami in those two years? Lazo says yes. What evidence do you have it's recovered? The rubble's not there. The rubble's gone. The bricks have been replaced, right? Notice all the bricks that were thrown up, right, by the tremendous water pressure, right? They're all put back together again. What if I told you both shots were taken at noon on a Friday? Would your answer change then? Oh, that's interesting. So, like, there's no people on the street. There's no people. By the way, notice this bicycle here? There's no car, no bicycle. Yeah. This owner of the shop actually had come back to clean up in his store. Two years later, there's not even a bicycle there, right? So, the question about recovery is a challenging one. How do you measure recovery? No, Michael's talking about this with networks, right? How do you measure recovery more broadly? If I ask a business person in Japan, what's the bellwether for recovery? You know what their answer was? 7-Elevens. 7-Elevens, you can buy underpants, you can buy tickets, you can pay utilities, you can get beer, it needs refrigeration systems, and logistics to get there. If the 7-Eleven is running, probably everything else is running as well. That's their vision of recovery. Ask school teachers, what's their vision of recovery? It's butts in seats. How many students are back in my classroom? Real estate agents, how many homes are open, right, for sale or for rent? So I used 14 different ways to measure recovery in this project. Another example, of Tug this is Tugersville. This is two weeks, about a year and a half, this is three years. Now this white van, right, I can't explain exactly why it's there over time. I've got, very, I've got insurance fraud, but maybe that's a different discussion. But you see things are going well, right? You can see here that there's a dump truck picking up the garbage, right? Everything's going well, they're planting the bottom, which is good. So again, let me ask you guys. Measuring recovery in a holistic way, not just schools, not just roads or hospitals, but these 14 measures, what do you think would drive the recovery process? Which villages and towns and cities will build back, will bounce back quickest? People. I heard people, I heard networks. No one wants to venture in and say people that knows. Okay, so let me tell you a quick story. This is not a bridge. This is a $200 million conveyor belt. What's it conveying? This area used to be all mountains, up to about here. This village I'll call Coastal City, as a nice suited it for you, began crushing all the mountains, putting the rebel on this conveyor belt, taking it almost a mile downtown, and then slowly raising up the downtown's base level by around 14 meters, which is what? Uh, yeah, the, the 37 feet yeah. or so? We can do more. Okay, 14 meters, yeah. taller than it used to be. Yeah. Now, this cost $200 million for the conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. The overall process is around $2 billion. This village is less than 20,000 people. You can do the math how much it costs per person. Mm -hmm. So I began to wonder, well, if Coastal City has this amazing contraption and is crushing mountains to build a downtown area, of course, every village of the 144 along the coast is doing that, right? No. Only this one. 
I ask them, gently, in Japanese, how do you guys build this again? Like, where'd the money come from? It wasn't a bake sales, right? It turns out one of the members of the mayor's committee is a pretty well-known, let's call him a McKinsey consultant. We'll call him McKinsey for the sake of it. And he had some friends in the cabinet office in Japan. One week after the shock, he called his friend in the cabinet office and said, we're going to need a lot of money. A lot of money, like billions of dollars. And they said, OK. Now, I went to a lot of other villages in Japan. Trust me, this is the only conveyor belt system. They're the only raising one system. That aspect of having vertical ties across the area is what's driving recovery. Here's what we found. Again, controlling for all the other factors, local economics, demographics, area, size, everything else. The best predictor of recovery are vertical networks, not horizontal ones, not knowing your neighbors. Your neighbors don't have $2 billion. Maybe they do, in case it's high on your neighborhood, right? But here's what happens. In the average city in Japan, there are zero or one boosters, let's call them, powerful politicians who love your area. Think about Ted Kennedy, or what's that guy from Nevada? Senator Harry Reid, right? Powerful people who can pull those levels of power. If you only had one or two of them, we estimate you'd be about 70% recovered. Meaning, 70% of your schools would have butts in the seats, and 70% have 7-Elevens. But as you build more powerful politicians, and some, in fact, had 6 or 7, you build back better. You get more schools, more roads, more 7-Elevens. At this stage, unlike the first one of survival, in the recovery stage, it's vertical ties that matter. One more question. Long-term mental health after radiological combination of it. This is an image of the evacuation zone around this yellow dot, which is Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Um, if you've been there, by the way, in this area, uh, you can see that every home is still boarded up by a metal gate locked by the police. People like me, tourists, I guess, can't get in. Homeowners can't get in. It's still closed now, eight and a half years later. 160,000 people lived in this colored in area. All of them had to leave, some within two hours of the evacuation, and some left multiple sites. They went from Futaba to Namie, Namie, the cloud spread, went to Namie Itate, the cloud spread again, they left again. So in some cases, they had four evacuations over that first few, few weeks. Now, what kind of things might be on your mind if you'd been living in Futaba, and all of a sudden the alarms go off, and someone knocks on your door and says, Daniel, you've got two hours to pack up and leave on this bus. What kind of concerns might you have? You guys are watching Chernobyl on HBO these days? Uh-huh, yeah. What's on your mind? What about his belongings? Yeah. Family, so health, I'm assuming, right? Stuff. Stuff. Yeah. I've got a mortgage on my place. By the way, banks don't really care if your home is evacuated. There had to be double mortgages in some cases. Leukemia, thyroid cancer, all the stuff for your kids and for yourself. Well, I'd be okay in 5, 10, 20 years down the road, right? Watching Chernobyl makes you a bit nervous tonight, right? And of course, the future, can you ever go back to your home again? You own this home or you're living in a home. You had two hours to evacuate. Now, literally, they're filled with weeds. There are packs of ostriches and boars running around from the local zoo that got out, right? This area is basically like Mad Max's Thunderdome area, right? There's no one left but people who break in. So can you ever go back again? Do you even want to go back? All those uncertainties, all those insecurities mean people who've been interviewing are really, really concerned about themselves, their families, and the future. So we began using a very simple measure called the Kessler 6 or K6 Mental Health Index. It's a very simple question, don't answer out loud, but over the past month, how often have you had a problem falling asleep and staying asleep? Do you want to say it out loud? Of course, Lazo's here. Everything's going to be fine. You probably never had that problem. <laughs> Some people, though, might have that problem. If you've never had that problem, give yourself a zero. If it's a problem all the time, give yourself a four. Now, we have six questions like that. The maximum score, of course, is 24. The minimum is zero. The average across Japan is a 3.1. In America, it's a three. Okay? So three is the, is the median score of the Now, we measured three different villages. I mentioned Futaba, which is right near the plant. Ishinomaki we saw already with the yellow bands, and now it's even further away. These two villages only had the earthquake and tsunami. <coughs> Futaba had nuclear power plant meltdowns plus earthquake and tsunami. Now, the slowest category is 0 to 4. Ishinomaki now went about half. Futaba, about 17%. Next category up, now we're getting a bit more nervous, right? Maybe now we see a therapist, hopefully they help things out. 5 to 9 score. About half Ishinomaki, a little less than half in Yamada. Less than 25% in Futaba. Third category, now psychologists will tell you, and the scores are 10 to 12, you should be getting help, right? Maybe you have medication, you maybe can't go to work at that point. 10 to 12 is very small in all three categories. Here it's around 8%, 8%, about 12% there. Look at the highest measurable category that we had in our study of 800 people. 50% of Futaba have PTSD level levels of stress, compared to only 8% and 7% in these two communities, meaning 
the radiological contamination is adding levels of stress that are fantastically important to us as human beings. Again, watching Chernobyl, you get that kind of ooky feeling, right? Okay, next question. What reduces mental anxiety in the long term after radiological contamination? I'll give you an honest answer. I thought it was Donald Trump. Because if your doctor tells you that you're healthy and you're wealthy, between health and wealth, we figured that would reduce those symptoms. Why? Because you can move someplace else. You can get radiation scans on a regular basis. You can have a doctor move you to someplace healthy. Sad answer quickly is neither really helps. Across every level of income, from $10,000 US to $80,000 plus, no level of wealth makes you immune to the concerns you have. In terms of health, it gets even worse. If you eat like nuts and berries and run marathons, like Michael here, right? That's fine, there's no impact. But if you're sick beforehand, if you had a health condition, diabetes, asthma, whatever else, there's a multiplying negative effect, meaning negative physical health interacting with negative mental health. So if health and wealth aren't helpful, what do you think would be? Networks. Ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> Best predictor of reducing <laughs> stress. <laughs> it's one more year of your post talk now. <laughs> Mental stress was best alleviated by having neighbors and friends that go with it through the same process. I feel not alone. I've got a network of people bonding, bridging, and people living nearby who I can talk with. Okay. So how do you measure the network here? So here it was the number of known neighbors I see. I'm okay. still in contact with. So a very specific type of network, so it just wasn't how many friends you have, but yeah. no neighbors. Because okay. other connections in other vertical and horizontal than that here, only people living nearby, you can talk with, exchange tea with. Okay. So really quickly, part of my lab's job is to think through not only what factors help resilience and recovery, but also how do we then change the conditions in the communities, whether it's in Montreal or in Toronto, some of these are going right now in San Francisco and in Boulder, Colorado, some of them in Wellington and Tokyo. So these are five sets of programs we have to try and increase social cohesion, especially in vulnerable communities. Hopefully you recognize this guy with the red sweater? Yep. Fred Rogers. Unfortunately, he's deceased now about seven years. When I was a kid every morning, he said, Daniel, be a good neighbor. He didn't say Daniel, but he said, be a good neighbor, right? So again, if I ask you how many of you know 10 neighbors' first and last names, and have an email address or a phone number to reach them when the power goes out for a few days, of course, you'd all raise your hands, because again, you're all network people. In an urban environment like Tokyo, or Boston, or Mumbai, or Mexico City, turn one in eight of us can do that, right? That's a, that's a problem because these people, these first zero responders, are the ones first in the scenes when there's a heart attack, or dislocated shoulder, or a fire. Well, it would always happen in my neighborhood, and it was neighbors who were there first, well before the firefighters got there. So if we don't know our neighbors, that's the first line of building this kind of resilience. Neighbors, neighborhood. This is in fact a block party in Indiana where I used to live. Maybe not as fun as in Boston. But you know what a black party is, right? You close off the street to cars, you bring out the stuff, you get the kids get a bounce house. Right now in San Francisco, neighbors who want it will get $5,000 to have a neighbor fest, a party for their block, where they get permits for live music, they get a bounce house, and they get one small table on disaster recovery materials. What's the idea? San Francisco can't afford to retrofit every building. It's too expensive. And by the way, about a third of the buildings are already on landfill, so retrofitting them won't help anyway. But even if you could do that, it's much cheaper to build a resilient neighborhood than a resilient building. Right now, Dan Homsey in San Francisco is doing this neighbor fest program as part of the work that we've done. Okay. Neighbors, neighborhood, city planning, physical infrastructure. We know that physical infrastructure drives the kind of social ties that we have. For example, if you live at the end of a long driveway with a garage door, I can promise you you've got fewer friends than on-street parking and a porch, right? We know that Jane Jacobs' third spaces, the organic beating heart of the city, matter. Uh, one of my students, Courtney Tan, you might have met her, Courtney's been measuring trees, literally measuring trees in Cambridge. How many trees are there? How many branches are there? How many spots are there? And she's literally mapped it out and then correlated that very well with existing social ties. That is to say, you need to have a physical space like this kind of space or outdoor space to meet in. So this is literally tree hugging? It is literally tree hugging. Well, it's shade hugging. <laughs> it's a tree, so it could be a metal tree. So neighbors, neighborhood, city. Fourth approach is through boring meetings, people like this one, right? You've got talking and blah, blah, blah. Most democracies need civic engagement. We need individuals coming up to meetings. The problem, of course, is it's the same five people at all the meetings. At the zoning meetings, the PTA boarding, the environmental meetings. So part of our lab thinks through, how do you get citizens to show up at meetings and become involved? For example, different times on different dates, same meeting multiple times. 
You offer food, you offer childcare, you make it interactive, unlike this meeting, right? Everything we can to make these events more engaging. And finally, the fifth program we've tried has been community currency or time banking. We want you to volunteer more often. The excuse we often get is it's too expensive and enough time. So places like Toronto will give you five Toronto dollars for an, you can do it when you get there, right? Uh, five Toronto dollars for an hour of work. In Ithaca, it's Ithaca dollars. In Onagawa, Japan, it's Onagawa yen. In Littleton, New Zealand, it's Littleton something about it. I can't remember what it is. But in all these communities, if you volunteer, you get back something for doing so. Now, what happens with this money? You can't go to McDonald's, you can't go to Burger King. Only local businesses take this money. So you take an hour of volunteer work, turn it into currency, it goes into a small business, let's say a farmer's market. If they get it, they can't go to their suppliers, they can only go to local businesses. What you do is build a virtuous cycle. We found all five programs can raise social cohesion around 14% over a year and a half. To the degree that we have a program called Ibasho in Japan. Ibasho means something like my place, more or less, in Japanese. This is our young board of directors. You have to be over 65 to join. And Ibasho was built post-tsunami in an area completely relocated to high ground that had no social connection whatsoever. No one had ever met before. They're all from different villages stuck together. And they asked us as a lab, help us build a space where we can build connections. So we helped them raise the money to build this physical space that you see. This is one part of the building. It's pretty broad from the outside space. The programming is up to them. But we asked them if we could measure their and their neighbors' daily interactions. They said yes. So this was so successful, we actually now have branches in the Philippines and Nepal, thanks to the World Bank. And the, but the bottom line was, it is possible to build social cohesion, even post-disaster, through events like Ibasho. It broadens the network size, it broadens efficacy, and also broadens your sense of belonging. Remember the exit versus voice idea. Okay, wrapping it up. I've made three arguments today, hopefully three, which have made all. Argument number one is about survival. Who gets through an event? Now you might think it's about buying food and water and batteries and having that hand-cranked radio, especially if you're a hoarder or a survivor, right? You got all that stuff. The reality is what we found is the following. You, individually, your behavior doesn't matter as much as the network where you live. If the community as a whole is cohesive and interactive, even if you're an elderly person in a wheelchair, your life will still be saved, even if you yourself are not the most gregarious, outgoing person. So it's not your individual network that matters as much as the, place, the spatial network in which you're embedded. That's the first thing. Second thing is the recovery process, right? So again, we might imagine it's about grit, it's about local businesses and all that kind of stuff. No, no, it's about who do you know? Who at the central government can direct resources towards you at that critical time? Do you have boosters that your community has tied into to, sh to shoot you the goods that you need? And over the very long term, as you're struggling with issues like mental health recovery, it's not about how much money you have or how well or healthy you are. In those moments, you need to have, again, a spatially connected network around you to make you feel that you're not going through this by yourself, that you have some kind of network to assist you. And hopefully, as network scientists, this is really obvious to all of you, I hope. But the sad reality is the vast majority of the money we're spending right now, domestically, internationally, is on physical infrastructure. By the way, what do you think Japan did immediately post-disaster after all the seawalls were knocked down and none of them saved any lives? Rebuilt them. They rebuilt them. $240 billion. The biggest investment so far in Japan post-311 has been rebuilding exactly as it was the mass network. That sounds dumb, right? Guess what FEMA does? FEMA's checks until just about four months ago only recovering a building as was. You see, you had a hospital that was in a flood zone. First floor, the MRI. FEMA would only cut you a check if you had what? A plan to rebuild as was. You want to build it differently, that's a different plan, it's a completely different process. So most of the money that we're spending is on physical infrastructure. This concept of physical infrastructure is a great one. It's obvious, it's immediate. The mayor can point to the wall and say, well, see what I built? I built a wall, get it? Built a wall, right? But the reality is the impact of those systems on like mortality, on recovery, on mental health is far, far, far smaller. So the one argument I would make would be the incredible importance of social networks. Thank you. Which one's coming up? Uh, this middle one is the, is the one that we're like a Japanese one, right? Yeah, that one's coming up. That one came out already. Cool. Questions? Please. Can you talk a little bit more about the difference between sort of strong social ties versus strong community cohesion? So things like knowing your neighbor's first and last names is clearly a sign. It's an indicator of strong social cohesion, but not knowing them doesn't necessarily mean there isn't social cohesion. 
That's right, exactly. So you, um, so even more t more sharply, you, me not knowing 10 neighbors, first and last names, maybe that my, in my personal network, right, from mapping my network is pretty weak. Maybe I'll only have a friend nearby, maybe I'm a grandparent and I only have my grandson. But if I'm in a community, and this is why it's really important in our lab to measure the community network, that is itself, for example, able to name, oh yeah, Daniel lives next door, he's kind of the weird recluse, kind of strange guy, talks to himself all the time, right? As long as they know who I am and that I'm gonna need help, that, that connection is actually, we think, more important than me being plugged in, gregarious, outgoing, and everything else, right? So it's funny, sometimes you see people measuring network strength by sort of the aggregate of the individuals in it, we think it's much more critical to think about the spatial continuity of it, right? So we'll ask questions like, in your neighborhood, how do you solve the following problems? Or if someone, a simple question for you guys, if there's live music playing nearby, right, how do you solve that problem? Someone's going to party at 2 o'clock playing salsa. What do you do? So, so you could call the cops, right? If you could call the cops, but hopefully you know the neighbor, right? So you could, you could text them and say, hey, Jim, it's pretty loud and you're down, right? So we often look at, for example, third-party interventions. Um, same thing with businesses. Uh, are businesses themselves well connected socially, or do they have to go to outside parties for enforcement? So we think it's really important to think through individual connections is one measurement, but more, more broadly, does the community have a number of individuals with that sense of social tie? Questions? Yeah. When you did your research in uh, New Orleans, how did you did those folks? Did you give them a definition of what recovery meant, or was it just completely subjective? Yeah, we, that, that was the early on the research. We wanted to know what they thought. Right, so it wasn't asking them, you know, have you gotten money for insurance? Mm -hmm. well, so it's almost like a mood indicator, right? When you say the word recovery, are things going well? And the funny thing was, we saw some people literally only had one foot of water, right, which would have meant very, very minimum. We knew this, we did this. Literally just digging out maybe six inches of drywall, and that's pretty much all you have to do. Um, or some electrical stuff. But, you know, for people with 10 feet of water versus six inches, the answers were so radically different for us. So we, we, we have actually have used objective measures of recovery as well in other areas. So again, we can use LIDAR scans and how much water actually was there as another countermeasure. With um, hurricanes in Indiana, we actually measured the storm track and measured damage there and recovery. We also asked a subjective question just to get a feeling. We think it's really important, right? You may feel things are going really badly, even though compared to your neighbors, you had little damage and things are going quite well. No more questions, I'd like to thank the speaker.